You just paid four hundred thousand dollars for a camel statue today on Coffee with Conrad. Winning. Yeah, that was the picture of the camel that you paid for. It's a $400,000 piece of artwork um, to an embassy. The State Department paid for it. And I'm like going, yeah, that's where we should spend our money on camel art. State Department. Okay, this comes from Zena Nevins, Reason.com. March 31st, so it's not April 1st. I mean, this I know, you know, the April 1st thing, April Fool's Day, you'd think, but it was March 31st. I'm, like, trying to figure this out. State Department spending 400000 on a camel statue in Pakistan. Yeah, mm-hmm, State Department. Budget cuts, so we buy a camel. Okay, so here's the article. The State Department sure is in anguish from deep budget cuts like every year. Heck, the cupboards are so bare... They even bled $30 million from the Fulbright program this month. What can the department still afford? Mm. I'm taking a sip of coffee because I'm not really sure if, you know, if I'm awake. Maybe I should pinch myself. Okay, I'm awake. I pinched myself. How about a 500-pound fiberglass, aluminum, stainless steel, acrylic, and painted statue of a camel to be put on display at the American Embassy in Pakistan. And it only costs $400,000. And it's not even a one-of-a-kind work. Dude, we all know what happens when you buy an $800 hammer. Some Your buddy makes $799. I mean, you know, that's what's happening. Some camel artist made some money here. Um... BuzzFeed got access to a document about the procurement of a camel contemplating a needle and has an exclusive report. No, now there we go. We've got maybe a biblical message. It's easier to, what's that scripture? It's easier to get an amel, camel through the eye of a needle than a rich man into heaven. Well, maybe, maybe they're just trying to like illustrate some scripture and, you know, we can call it a, a biblical evangelical effort. Nope, I don't think so. Yeah, nice try. The work by noted American artist John Baldessari depicts a life-size white camel made of fiberglass starring in puzzlement, staring in puzzlement. Yeah, I would be too if I was a fiberglass camel. I'd be staring in puzzlement. At the eye of an oversized shiny needle, a not-so-subtle play in the New Testament phrase about the difficulty the wealthy have in entering the kingdom of heaven. Oh, so it is scriptural. Wow. So the prosperity doctrine is getting balanced out by the State Department. Hmm, interesting. Personally, I thought the camel's expression was more like a smug realization of its own sticker price, but I digress. To emphasize Baldessari's fame, the contracting officials pulled a section from Wikipedia. John Anthony Baldessari, born June 17, 1931, is an American conceptual artist known for his work featuring found photography and appropriated images. In a State Department, in a statement, the State Department press spokeswoman Christine Foshi said the proposed purchase comes from the department's Office of, Office of Art in the embassies. In new construction products projects, she said, a small part of the total funds, about 0.5%, is spent on art purchases. The State Department may have gotten a pretty good deal on the camel, since Baldessari has sold even less inspiring works for millions. But they could have done even better if they'd opened the opportunity to competition. The t department didn't do that, though, insisting that only this camel could satisfy 
the unique artistic criteria for the embassy. You know, I keep thinking about, well, you know, there's there's like, uh, there's all these organizations. Like, if you're in business and you've, you know anything about purchase orders and requisitions and the committee meetings like you know government agencies they're they're the worst i mean like if you need an ink cartridge dude i know agencies like if you've got a computer problem all you need is a hard drive just say a hard drive because yours is shot it's plainly obvious yours is shot so instead of running down to best buy and buying a hard drive and putting it in which takes probably an hour uh, to install it and everything or two if you have to you know overwrite the drive and reinstall windows that type of thing they wait a month and just lose all that productivity you know so I'm wondering here like on a camel you know I wonder how the the purchase order requisition thing came about you know oh I need a requisite we need a camel for the embassy so let's get together and let's have a meeting I mean this is what these people do with the money they're given ah anyway yeah so i understand we need some art but how about like a 50 dollar painting from venice beach or something you know spend that four hundred thousand dollars on somebody that needs some food <laughs> you know what i'm saying ah anyway i wanted to bring that to your attention hi this is glenda linkus from wingsofprophecy.com you're listening to coffee with conrad on conradrocks.net when I cry, oh God, I'm to my bed. Thank you for visiting ConradRocks.net. Conrad Rocks is supported by people just like you. If you've been blessed by Conrad Rocks, please prayerfully consider giving an offering. You can conveniently do so by using the Contribute button on the sidebar at ConradRocks.net. Regular contributors get a spot on the Conrad's Comrades page, which links back to the blog or social media of your choice. You can also help Conrad Rocks by sharing your favorite posts on Facebook. Thanks again for being a part of Conrad Rocks. Remember, Jesus rules. That is higher than I Now, I know I threatened to not bring bad news, but there's just all this bad news. Air Force is removing a Bible from the from POW MIA display. So, every day when I'm searching for articles to bring to you, um, there's just, there's persecution of Christians all over the globe. Um, one of the funny things is, it's not funny, ha-ha, it's, it's interesting, is how the mainstream media is not highlighting uh, a lot of the persecution that's going on. You have to go to the, to the uh, persecution magazines, you have to go to the, you know, the Christian magazines that highlight it. You know, they don't have a big audience, so most of the people aren't even aware of the stuff that's going on. Now, with the Jesus Jam Texas event that's coming up, one of the focuses is, you know, we're this is for a benefit for wounded warriors. Um, and one of the things that I'm doing behind the scenes, you know, I'm trying to get testimonies from... Dude, I'm talking to people that know what they're talking about, too. Um, I'm getting testimonies from soldiers, from veterans, you know. They're like, you know, seriously? A few years ago, I could say the name Jesus. But now if you start saying Jesus in, in the military... There's a problem. People even talk of being, you know, you could possibly be court-martialed for stuff that you were free to do a few years ago. Now, think of it this way. You know, one of the buzzwords is, oh, they hate us for our liberty, you know. Um, well, 
didn't, you know, wasn't George Washington like, you know, the founding fathers and, you know, we left Europe for religious persecution and stuff like that. Aren't we fighting for religious liberty? You know, isn't that what we're fighting for? So if we're fighting for it, then how come it's being so restricted in these military, in the military? I don't get it. And I do talk to people on the phone about their, their, their testimonies, possibly giving their testimonies at Jesus Jam. And there really is a big problem. It's a big problem. So we're going to read this article about how the Air Force removes the Bible from the POWMIA display. Air Force removes Bible from POWMI display. Todd Starnes, FoxNews.com, March 31st, 2014. The year of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. On March 14th, Air Force Chief of Staff Mark Welsh told members of the House Armed Services Committee that there was no war on religious liberty. Now, you just feel that March 14th. They said something, and we were just talking about sedition yesterday. And remember, I was talking about the Lord tries the reins of the hearts. You know, you can't serve God and mammon. And then some people are afraid of what will happen to their body. Jesus says, you know, take no thought. You know, don't fear the one that can uh, hurt your body, but fear the one that's going to throw your body and soul both in hell. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew the difference, you know, before they bowed down to the to the mandate of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel knew to, you know, even though they took prayer out of schools, Daniel prayed anyway, because Acts 5, 29, we're supposed to obey God rather than man. So we see here that just we're being set up, being set up. Somebody says one thing, it's what politicians do. There was a tweet, there was a tweet yesterday. I saw some, uh, I, I put it up, I said something about, um, I get up, upset when liars' pants aren't on fire. You know, can you imagine, all of Congress would be burning, right? Anyway, so here we have something said March 14th. Um, and I, it's the first sentence, obviously, they're about to reverse here. The single bis biggest frustration I've had in this job is the perception that somehow there is religious persecution inside the United States Air Force. The general told lawmakers it's not true. Representative John Fleming told me the Air Force seems to be the worst offender when it comes to attacks on religious liberty. If that's true, perhaps General Welsh could explain why a Bible was removed from a POWMI missing man table at Patrick Air Force Base in Florida. The removal of the good book was first reported by the Gannett-owned newspaper, Florida, Florida Today. Base officials confirmed to Fox News Monday that the entire missing man table display had been removed from a dining hall because of the Bible. Because of the Bible. A press statement said the inclusion of the Bible ignited controversy and division. Yeah, it makes people think about their sins. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, we as a Christian, instead of coddling people into hell, we should offend them into heaven. I mean, seriously, the Bible's offensive. The gospel is offensive. You know, repent and be baptized. You know, learn who Jesus is. Have a relationship with him. It offends people. Missing man tables are a long-honored military tradition. The tables serve as a reminder of the plight of brave Americans who are missing in action or who are being held prisoner of war. The display includes a white tablecloth setting with an inverted glass, a plate with lemon and salt, or a single rose, a candle, and a Bible. You know, guys, they say they hate us for our liberty, and we're fighting for liberty, and one of those is religious liberty. Now we can't, the people that are doing the fighting for liberty are restricted themselves, and this is prevalent. It's prevalent. That's why we're having JesusGMTexas.com on Memorial Day. We've got to remember what this is all about. We've got to remember our roots. Why are we fighting? You know, there's some people fighting for centuries. They don't even know why anymore. They just know they hate each other. What's that all about? We need to know why we're doing these things. Each item is an integral part of the missing man table and honor ceremony. According to the National League of Families of American Prisoners and Missing in Southeast Asia, the Bible represents the strength gained through faith in our country, founded as one nation under who? Under God. 
To sustain those lost from our midst, the official ceremony document states. So I wonder if they're going to take, now God is a title, it's not a name. You know, and, and I'm always talking about how, no, you can talk about God all you want. You can talk about, um, you know, the God doesn't seem to invoke negative emotions. It doesn't seem to be device, d- divide, but you use the word Jesus. You know, that's something about the name of Jesus. You know, Jesus is the Word of God, and a lot of people equate the Bible with being the Word of God. However, some at Patrick Air Force Base objected to the Bible's placement on the table. The following is the Air Force explanation of what happened. Before I get there, I want to talk about, you know, being offended. Why... You know what's happening is Christians are just sitting here. We're laying, we're rolling with the punches, and I understand. Turn the other cheek. I get it. But the flesh in Uncle Conrad, the carnal mind, and this is not inspired by God at all. You know, I'm sitting here, Lord, you know, how do you how are we supposed to handle your will? And you know, you want to just say, Look, you're 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 going to hell. You need to like repent, man. And that's not the way we evangelize. I guess you can, but one of the part of me wants to start complaining. You know, just just kind of like turn the tables. Let's start complaining and suing over secular stuff. Oh, your um, your secular poster of that woman is offensive to me. Take it down, or I'm going to sue you. Let's start suing them for allowing people to put up like scantily clad women when it's offensive or calendars you know the days of the week are named after pagan deities i mean you know we could get ridiculous um we could sue over the easter bunny being a pagan thing or halloween i mean let's just you'll just start suing and raising cain like they do uh how about secular music being offensive we hear that blasting down the halls like turn that down or, or people that use profanity what if we just started suing every time like they do us you know, it's it, part of me wants to just get even. You know, what if we just started <laughs> like, hey, but you know what? We wrestle not with flesh and blood and turning the cheek is actually more of a god. It's more of a godly approach. I mean, Jesus says to do it, but I want you to think about this. Did Peter was rebuked for cutting off Malchus's ear? You know, he's trying to save Jesus using violence. And Jesus rebuked him for doing so. You'll notice the New Testament post-cross scriptures are more like, hey, you know, we got to carry our cross. Um, that's what it's all about. And suffering, you know, bearing in our body the marks of Jesus Christ actually promotes the gospel. I mean, think about it. What would have happened if the disciples would have fought back except they were they were all martyred. John, they tried to boil him alive, if you want to call him, yeah, he you know, he was boiled alive and it didn't work and they they were freaking out so they put him on the Isle of Patmos. But, you know, suffering is a part of the Christian life and this is this is kind of minor. You know, this is kind of minor compared to what Christians around the world are going through. And you know, another thing too, um well, let's, let's get back to the article, and I'll probably comment a little bit more. The following is the Air Force explanation of what happened. So they, they have some rationale here. The 45th Space Wing deeply desires to honor Americans' prisoners and war, POW and missing in action personnel. Unfortunately, the Bible's presence or absence on the table at the Riverside Dining Facility ignited controversy and division. Put a Koran there. Let's see what happens. Distracting from the table's primary purpose of honoring POWs and MIAs. Consequently, we temporarily replaced the table with the POW MIA flag in an effort to show our continued support of these heroes while seeking an acceptable solution to the controversy. After consultation with several relevant organizations, we now intend to reintroduce the POW MIA table in a manner inclusive of all POWs and MIAs as well as the Americans everywhere. 
The Air Force did not say when the missing man table would be returned, nor did they say whether the Bible would be included in the display. They also declined to explain what they meant by the word inclusive. Retired Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, now an executive vice president with the Family Research Council, denounced the Air Force Academy's actions. You know, to, to stand up for Jesus, you, you're going to remember we were talking about sedition yesterday and the roots of sedition. One of the things is we see that the devil pricks the reins of the heart. Jesus tries them too. Jesus allows the devil. I mean, you know, it's not like that may sound strange to you. That may sound strange to you. But remember, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Right? Let me find that verse. You know what I'm talking about. It's in Matthew 4.1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So, think of Job. God, it sounded like Job was having a bet with the devil, right? God only, you know, the devil basically is just the unwilling servant of God. If you'll ever notice, every time the devil looks like he's got this little victory in the Bible, you know, like, well, Paul got all upset, and he out of anger threw the demon out, cast the demon out without praying to God first, sounded like. He was walking outside of his authority. He just got angry, kind of like maybe Elisha did with the the, the, the bear that killed the 40-something children. Um, well, you'll notice that later a whole bunch of people get saved, you know, even though he gets run out of town. So it's like the devil is just the unwilling servant of God. It, it, all, is, it usually always ends up to be the furtherance of the gospel. So now we see that people are, temp you know, standing up for Jesus. You know, you're going to get tried. And, and during these times, during these times, I mean, you're going to be tried with mammon. You know, oh, I don't want to lose my job. You might be tried with court-martialing. You know, you may have to go to jail. Well, guess what? A lot of prophets spent time in jail. Two-thirds of the New Testament was written mainly by someone in jail, right? The prison epistles. Um, so... Sometimes, you know, that's going to happen. And we were talking about some tough stuff, tough stuff yesterday on the uh, the sedition, the roots of it. So you might want to listen to that if you can stand it. I mean, that's pretty tough. <laughs> but anyway, um, now back to the article here. Um, I'm still looking for somebody in a leadership position in the Air Force with an ounce of courage, he told me. This is back to General Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. They buckle to an extreme minority group every time, and, con and, and constitutionally, they are simply wrong. Representative John Fleming told me the Air Force seems to be the worst offender when it comes to attacks on religious liberty. It's very disconcerting that all it takes is for someone to be offended by that, and it comes down. Dude, let, let's see. That's where my my flesh wants to rear up. Let's be offended by everything they do. Let's just be offended about everything secular. <laughs> you know, let's sue over rock music in the hallways. Let's sue over secular posters. The days of the week, they're offensive. You know, I mean, you know, they're named after pagan gods or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm being, I'm going to the extreme here. But it seems like every time a Christian does something, it's like they come out of the woodwork to sue us. The Freedom From Religion Foundation? Do we have a Christian one to counter that? Is there one? I don't even know. They've got, they're getting all organized, you know. But anyway, we know that we need to love those that persecute us and despitefully use us. And we have a different approach. I understand. So... Now, Fleming accused the Air Force of even ignoring the law, since when does one unnamed, unknown individual have veto power over the First Amendment rights of all people in the military, and in this case, the Air Force, he asked. Ann Mills Griffiths is the chairman of the National League of POW-MIA families. She told me she was glad the Air Force base is going to reinstall the missing man table, but she wonders if the new display will include the Bible. Now, I'm, I'm going to finish the article here. I mean, I'm not going to finish, but you can find this. On April 2nd, the year of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2014, you can share this with um, your friends, your family, your honeycomb, your network, all of your social, 
all your social media, be sure and spread this around because we need to know, we need to meet people aware of what's going on in the armed forces. Not only are we spending $400,000 on a camel, we're taking the Bible out of the military. Why are, why are we even fighting? I mean, if God, if God's not in it, you're laboring in vain. Except the Lord build the house, those that labor, labor in vain. Amen. Hi, this is Monice from KeeperOfGodsWord.blogspot.com, and you're listening to Coffee with Conrad on ConradRocks.net. Angels, demons, demons, poltergeists, ghosts, ghosts, astral projection, projection, telepathy, telekinesis, levitation. In my book, Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey, I discuss many of my supernatural experiences pre and post salvation. I discuss what it takes to see in the kingdom of heaven. Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey is available on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle. You know, I've been talking a little bit about this Noah film. Um, I put a question out in the community. Should Christians raise a stink about this Noah film being directed by an atheist and it not being biblical at all? And It's kind of like taking our eye off the birdie a little bit. I find it kind of funny. I'm all about the God's Not Dead film because that's, I mean, that, that movie rocked for Jesus. You know, it shows a little bit about what it costs to follow the Lord. And uh, and then this, one of my fears, and it's not a fear, it's a concern, is that some people weak in the faith may go see this movie and think it's biblical. But, you know, there's several things that, to counter that scripturally. I mean, we have to think about, you know, uh, Matthew seven fourteen in that area. I'll just I'll just go to a scripture here. And this is the very premise behind be the few dot com, which you know we're not blogging too much, but it's the idea. There's the be the few Twitter account, and um, I was sitting at my desk one day, and the Lord goes, you know, be the few dot com, and I heard it, and I got the domain. I thought, wow, this is kind of crazy. And what's interesting is that, you know, when you think of be the few, you think be the few, the proud the Marines. You know, I was really surprised I got that website. But regarding Noah, Noah, how does this have to do with Noah? Well, Matthew 7, 14. Um, let's back up one verse. Enter ye in at the S-T-R-A-I-T, not straight like a straight line, but straight, which means surrounded with obstacles. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereon. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So, in a, basically, in a nutshell, seekers find. Um, there's an element of the Christian seeking God. You know, draw near to God. He will draw near to you. Let any man that lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not in James. Um, also, you know, there's a scripture that everybody quotes half of it all the time. They need to know the rest of it. It's Hosea 4, 6. You know, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. This is called being willfully ignorant. Willfully ignorant. I will reject you. I mean, most people just quote the first part. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But then there's the rest. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will reject you. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget the children. So there's a responsibility for the seekers here to get around the obstacles that are being thrown at us and go to the straight and narrow gate. So this whole Noah thing, I mean, you know, I can't go do eternal life for you. You've got a personal responsibility to be a seeker. You know, if you don't, if you just refuse to read the Bible, if you say, if you think the Bible is the Word of God and you refuse to read it, was that who is your God? 
You know what I'm saying? And Bible's the best selling book in ever. It's I mean, you know, if you don't if you have enough money to see this movie, you've got enough money to get an audio book. <laughs> an audio Bible. I mean, you can, you know, there's free ones online. So ask any Christian, they'll get you a Bible if you want one. So I'm thinking, you know, why are we raising a fuss? If people want to just go see an unbiblical film, then let them do it. I don't know. But anyway, I found something interesting here. Um, Words of Comfort by Ray Comfort. He had something interesting to say, and at the end there's a link. And I'm going to talk about it. Um, this is from on the box us. I reluctantly went to see Russell Crowe's Noah and justified paying Paramount, the producers of the blasphemous The Wolf of Wall Street, the cost of the ticket because a popular television program had invited me to share my thoughts. Noah's producer, Darren Aronofsky, once said, all of my charity work has always been about the environment. So I can understand why he thought that the biblical narrative is about saving innocent animals, but... What was he thinking when he had Noah build the ark with the help of a rock group? These embarrassingly absurd rock people stop around almost every scene of the first half of the movie. From a production viewpoint, I expected better in a more sensible motion graphics for such a big budget movie. From a biblical viewpoint, Noah himself is about as far away from the Noah of the Bible as he could get. Perhaps the best way to describe him and what he does in the movie would be to liken it to Hollywood doing a movie about Napoleon and portraying him as a tall, Japanese-speaking crocodile hunter who was into skydiving and Russian roulette. However, there's something more sinister about the production of this movie. Aha! See, now, this this is my problem. Um, Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. And, you know, he, he, you know, he, you put a little poison in the sandwich, you still kill somebody, even though they're getting fed, you know? Anyway, it's more than just a grown man with a childish imagination playing with an expensive toy. It's the blatant mischaracterization of a man of God in an attempt to undermine the authority of the Word of God. If Hollywood's Noah is a financial success, and guess what? So far it's making money. I suspect that a sequel will be a blasphemous mischaracterization of Jesus and his work on the cross. As with Noah... This will be given a pass by many professing church leaders who are mesmerized by the glitter of Hollywood. These are dark times indeed. Yet my fading hope is that if Hollywood ever sees fit to portray another biblical figure, they will get it right. They can have their poetic license, but they may stay faithful to the script revealed in the scriptures. If they do that, I will encourage Christians everywhere to flood the theaters. And I'm, not, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that conviction. Yeah, that's how I, God's not dead. Hey, man, go see that film. Yeah, I liked it. It's awesome. It seemed biblical, you know. Um, in the meanwhile, I'm encouraged that over 100,000 people freely saw our version of Noah. That's what I wanted to get to, <laughs> is he has a version of Noah, uh, and it came out within the first two days of its release. May those who have a Noah craving get their fix at noahthemovie.com. That's noahthemovie.com. For my video audience, here it is. This is from the producers of the award-winning 180. Remember that? I put that on my blog. Um, Noah in the Last Days, and you can watch it. It's a 30-minute documentary right there on NoahTheMovie.com. So if you have a craving for the, the movie Noah, but you want a biblical thing, you know, watch it. There it is. So I wanted to share that with you guys. God bless you. Hi, this is John with John Shaba House having coffee with Conrad. Hey Amen. I like it. That was great. Thank you for visiting ConradRocks.net. Conrad Rocks is supported by people just like you. If you've been blessed by Conrad Rocks, please prayerfully consider giving an offering. 
You can conveniently do so by using the Contribute button on the sidebar at conradrocks.net. Regular contributors get a spot on the Conrad's Comrades page, which links back to the blog or social media of your choice. You can also help Conrad Rocks by sharing your favorite posts on Facebook. Thanks again for being a part of Conrad Rocks. Remember, Jesus rules. That is higher than I'm a recently retired Army vet. It's been a little over 21 years in. You know, I come from a uh, broken home. I joined the Army when I was 17. Ended up going to combat three times during my time in. I turned to alcohol because I couldn't handle what I'd seen, what I'd been a part of. That ended up costing me my family. My wife uh, packed up our five kids at the time and left. Things kind of spiraled downhill from there. I just didn't care about my well-being. Started drinking a little heavier. I woke up one morning, decided that that was going to be the day that uh, I ended my life. Jesus Jam, Texas, Memorial Day. Time to meet Conrad's Comrades. Forever Redeemed Ministries. Our Fellowship Christian Church. Wingsofprophecy.com. HolyFireJapan.com Petri underscore Nips on Twitter Letters for the Lord's Prison Ministry Spreading-Joy.org And Texas Flip Gal on Twitter Thank you Thank for being you. Conrad's Comrades You know, I found an article about a Catholic archbishop, and we we got some time left. I thought I'd talk a little bit about it. Um, let's see. Atlanta Archbishop apologizes for lavish living, and he may sell his mansion. So let's take a look at this. This is from news.yahoo.com. When I do a religious search on Yahoo, I find a lot of Catholic news, which sometimes there's something good like this right here. Our Atlanta Archbishop apologizes for lavish living. He may sell his mansion, Carrie Gillum, March 31st, the year of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2014. There we go. U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops President Bishop Wilton Gregory pauses before the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Atlanta has apologized for building a, now he built this, a $2.2 million mansion to use as his home, a move that made him the object of derision and complaint, and said he may sell it. Archbishop Wilton Gregory said he took his eye off the ball after the Archdiocese received a $15 million donation from the estate of Joseph Mitchell, Mitchell a nephew Gone with the Wind author Margaret Mitchell. Pope Francis has been urging Roman Catholic officials to live simpler lives and has renounced the papal apartments in the Vatican Palace for modest quarters in a church guest house. Now that is pretty awesome. 
The Vatican removed a German bishop, dubbed the Bishop of Bling, last month from his job because he spent 31 million euros, or $43 million, on a residence where fittings included a bath that cost 15,000 euros and 2.9 million euro private chapel. You see why the world thinks Christianity is fake? It makes me makes me sad. In Monday's election, the Georgia Bulletin, the newspaper for in the Monday's edition, the Georgia Bulletin, the newspaper for the Atlanta Archdiocese, Gregory wrote. While my advisors and I were able to justify this project fiscally, logistically, and practically, I personally failed to project the costs in terms of my own integrity and pastoral credibility with the people of God of North and Central Georgia. He also said in the newspaper column that the archdiocese would begin the process of selling the mansion if it is in the will of the church and other advisors. A Vatican spokesman, spokesman said he had no comment. Now... You know, we talked about the camel looking at the eye and the needle. Isn't that interesting? Um, just so you guys know, I mean, I know there's lots of God wants you rich. God wants to bless you, and our blessings are coming, and this is the month, and God's going to bless all of it. I mean, all that, all that powder puff ick, tickling ear stuff. But there's a scripture in the Bible. It's called Deuteronomy. 818 it tells us basically what god thinks the wealth is all for in deuteronomy 818 and you probably don't hear this taught but it's in the bible and that's why the bible's a good book christians should read it <laughs> but thou shalt remember the lord thy god for it's he that giveth the power to get wealth now wait a minute there's going to be a comma and then it's going to say the word that Kind of like an if-then. You know, he gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers it is, as it is this day. So God gives us the ability to get wealth for the covenant, not for, you know, luxury living. It's for the covenant. We need to remember that. Also remember the whole eye of the needle thing. Let's just go to that and I'm going to let you go. You know, I feel compelled to read this because there's obviously something supernatural going on here. Um, yeah. And since that... Okay. Um, in Matthew 19, and this is probably for somebody, is probably a large message right now because both hit this show today and I wasn't aware of it till now, so... Matthew nineteen sixteen, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master... What good thing shall I do that I may eternal have eternal life? And he said unto them, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. <clears throat> he said unto them, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear witness, false witness, honor thy father and mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, the young man, notice that, that just so you guys know, I'm going to talk about this in a second, but that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not all ten. The young man said, And these all things, all these things I've kept from my youth up, what like I yet? Jeez, and he knew. <laughs> Jesus said to him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure. In heaven. Um, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus, here comes the camel thing. Jesus said to the disciples, Verily I send you that a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So we see here that <clears throat> Jesus is dealing with this guy. Um, and he thinks he needs to get to heaven by works. You know, what, what works can I do? 
what good works can I do to outweigh my bad works and how, you know, that type of thing. He knew, he knew deep down. A lot of us know that it's a change of heart that God's looking for, repentance, changing your mind and following Jesus. But he said, um, notice he went through some of the commandments there, but none of them dealing with God. He was dealing with his fellow man. You know, didn't say, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and strength. He didn't do that. And then he says, if you will be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor. Those who give to the poor lend to the Lord. That's a proverb. You know, God doesn't owe any man. So you'll get back. You're lending to the Lord, yo. That's what happens. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven. I mean, there's so many scriptures that say, lay up your treasures in heaven where moth and dust does not corrode. But, um, you know, these things, if we have these expensive mansions and stuff, they're basically a snare. For, you know, they're a snare keeping us out of eternal life. They're, they become something that leads us around by the nose. And we just read in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8.18 that the, the ability to get wealth is to establish the covenant. In today's dispensation, today's, we're in the New Testament. So we're to spread the gospel. That's what money is for. Wealth. Amen. And I want you to know something else, too. I mean, there's so many scriptures... You know, John the Baptist asking John, what are we supposed to do? He says, those with two coats, give to the one that has none. Right? I mean, think about it. Anyway, obviously there's something up with these scriptures today. There's something up with that camel looking at the needle. There's something up with the archbishop going, yeah, you know, I got to sell my stuff because there's something wrong here. He knew. So, you guys read read about the camel today. All right, well, that's it. I want to thank you guys for being in my life. Thank you for being a part of ConradRocks.net. Um, consider, prayerfully consider giving an offering because that's, you know, this blog is free to you, but it's not free to do. So um, we want to keep it going. Anyway, see you again here tomorrow at 9 o'clock Central Standard Time AM. God bless you. Till we meet again, dig deeper, go higher.